good afternoon I'm aware it's um lunchtime and people are working in primary care probably um you know trying to frantically deal with house calls and everything else but just give the audience a couple of minutes just to build a couple of minutes as people log on and then we'll um, introduce the panel today thanks for joining us Right, I realise people will be joining along the way, but we are recording, and so it'd be useful if we can start and give people a full hour of um, an update, which would be really useful. So today, um, thanks for funding of and that's your free um, sort of lunch and learn mini webinar um, for community oncology, and today's topic is upper GI cancer. Um, all of our speakers are working in southeast Wales, and um, so really great to have a really um, a standard bunch of people on this call to educate you for the next hour. Um, we've got two consultants from Belindra, we've got um, Dr. Beth San Thomas and Dr. Tom Crosby from Belindra, two gastroenterologists from Cardiff and Vale, um, Dr. San Habubi and Dr. Jeff Turner, and we've got Hannah Johnson, who's one of the specialist dietitians at Belindra Cancer Centre as well. Um, Charlotte Stevenson is the person who's been sending out the invites and um, coordinating the, um, the, the, the meeting itself, so um, she'll be the one who sends out your attendance certificate, and if at the end you can complete the evaluation, then you get your attendance certificate, and we know how to tailor these to the next um, group, which would be great. Um, Etz, and if you can put on the first slide, that'd be great, and then turn your videos off to the In terms of um, the sort of series of webinars, they are run by Cardiff University Postgraduate Department, which Dr Fiona Rawlinson has been hugely helpful um, in coordinating and unable to attend again today, but will be back, back with us shortly. Um, and Dr McButton from Village has also been instrumental in, in getting these on, off the ground as well. But again, clinical commitments, unfortunately, mean that he's not going to be with us today. Um, so um, Charlotte's just going to launch a couple of um, webinars, just uh, sorry, polls, just to identify um, where we are, um, where the viewers are who are, are watching at the moment. Um, if you can just... Um, complete the survey on the on the screen now. Um, it's anonymous, it'll just um, collate. Let me know who's in the audience today. That's great, thank you. Got response on those, Charlotte? So mostly GP trainees, GPs or GP trainees who are on, and then another um, doctor colleague and some palliative care team at the moment. That's great. And obviously more people from various worlds will join in mind. And the location, I think, is a, is a poll as well, isn't it, Charlotte? Can you share that one? Thank you. I know Fiona's always very interested in, that, in the somewhere else, isn't she? But we've got results on that, Charlotte. Fabulous. Yeah, so um, I don't know if the person who is somewhere else wants to put where they are in the chat, um, but um, if, you know, it's anonymous, so you don't need to. Um, but great to have colleagues from, you know, across Europe, and but mainly in Wales there, so thank you for that. Um, was there a third poll you wanted to share, Charlotte? So are we okay with those two? Oh, there we go. Yeah, it's where you normally work. So um, what setting you would, your work would be in. In terms of comments today, there is a comments chat bar. There's also a Q&A chat bar, which we keep an eye on. So if you do have a question that the panellists um, are you know, not, not making clear or you want to ask an added question, then just pop it in the Q&A and, and when we can, we'll get the chance to interrupt and ask the question ourselves for you or we'll leave them and save them to the end and, and hopefully get some time at the end of the meeting to, to just run those. Fabulous, so many in the community, some secondary care, some specialist care, lovely. Well, let's um, pass on to the um, main event then. So, um, Betts, and I'll pass the mic to you. Um, and I think, um, is it Tom up first? Are you gonna do the first slide? I realize that we all know, thank you. The one that's being shared currently, Betts, and is a, is a thank you slide, but if you can move it to Tom's first slide, that'd be great. Um, okay, sorry. 
I've thrown you now, but I ask you to put those uh, Cardiff Uni slides on, haven't I? Sorry. Sorry, Elise, it's not working. Um, who can share? That's okay, no problem. I think it says only host. Hold on. Um, please. Charlotte is um, Bets on a host. Oh, there we go. It looks like it's working. Shall I just start, Bethan? Yes, there please. We go. Thank you, <laughs> Professor Crosby. Thanks, yeah, I, as always, it's a little bit odd because I'm not sure who I'm talking to really. I can't see you all, but um, I, I'm Tom Crosby, Professor Crosby, one of the uh, consultant oncologists at, at Valendra, but I've also got a national role um, in cancer services in Wales. And um, I am going to fly through these slides quite quickly because um, the, there are a number of speakers today and we want to get through them and hopefully get some sort of question and answers at the end. Um, but a lot, some of this data is is comparing um, I, what I, I thought I'd start with is the sort of context of the outcomes from esophageal gastric cancer in, in Wales and, and the UK. And some of that is from, from national audit data that we do between England and Wales. But some of the data is from um, uh, other comparative studies with, with other countries and jurisdictions from around the world. Um, international Cancer Benchmarking Partnership being a key one. Um, and um, I'll be very happy to come back on another day and maybe go through the wider context of what the outcomes from cancer are like in Wales and some of the some of the reasons from that. But what we know is uh, that, that, um, that as, as with other cancers, um, cancer demand is rising, mainly through aging populations, but some cancers are going up and down. Um, we might hear a little bit about that around, you know, adenocarcinoma, the esophagus going up as a result of probably obesity and reflux disease, etc. But the distal gastric cancers that used to be more prevalent and squamous cancers are either stable or, or, or falling. Um, we do have poor outcomes uh, from uh, cancer uh, survival in in um, in Wales and the rest of the UK, and um, you probably have some theories on on what that is. But we ha we have um, broken down um, that that key highlight uh, highlight um, data around uh, sort of cancer survival, and we think some of the key issues are access to diagnostics, workforce being the key element. Um, but facilities, equipment, configuration of services. We know that we're diagnosing patients in, in Wales and the rest of the UK at a later uh, stage uh, where we know the outcome's worse. And we know also uh, in Wales, and particularly it'll come to it with OG cancer, uh, more patients are presenting as an emergency uh, where, where we know the outcomes are not so good. We know our path pathways Cancer pathways are too long, even after the patient presents to the healthcare system. And we've measured that uh, compared to other countries and, and jurisdictions. Um, there is something about how we're managing older patients, whether it's their comorbidities or the stoical nature of our older patients, or it's some um, sort of bias from, from, from the health system, but, but we don't seem to be so active in treating older patients in the UK. Um, there's something about access to new treatments and innovations, um, and also something about uh, a lack of high quality and accessible integrated data, uh, which I suspect we're all um, uh, aware of. So next slide. So I think this is some of the, the data can move the slide on. So this is looking at esophageal cancer and, uh, and uh, this is a published Concord data, where, uh, which is uh, run by the registries in, in all of these sort of countries. Um, this, is, <laughs> this is relatively good. We're 15 out of 29 countries. Um, uh, in, on the next slide for gastric cancer, uh, things are worse and uh, we are, um, 31 out of 32 countries. Um, some of this may be that we've got really good registry systems, but everybody who has looked at this um, has suggested that that doesn't account uh, for all of the problems. And some of it must be the uh, uh, systematic because it is not just OG cancer, it's across the whole range of, uh, of, of malignancies. We see these patterns. Wales is similar to the rest of the UK, but just tends to be towards the bottom of the league table, but probably no different to the northwest and northeast of England and, and other areas of, of similar deprivation. So next slide. 
And if that hasn't depressed you enough, um, are we catching up? Are you know recent initiatives um, improving things? Well, they are. Um, I think uh, you know outcomes from cancer are, are getting better, um, but we're not closing the gap on other countries. And 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 this is showing that um, over the two time periods demonstrated there, we have improved uh, overall sort of survival, both at one year and, and the data here for five year. But so have all the other countries, and we haven't really uh, closed the gap as yet. Um, and I think there's a similar graph for gastric cancer um, on the next, where the, the outcomes in Wales are, 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 are not so good. Um, and, and we may um, you know, question why. Most of the cancers that tend to present with more vague symptoms, uh, we tend to uh, not be so effective at dealing with in, in Wales and the UK. So next slide. Um, and if that's not sort of embarrassing enough when we compare ourselves to other countries there's also significant variation uh, across wales and uh, sometimes significant differences um, 15 20 percent differences in outcome one and 12 uh, and five year survival between um, areas and locations just uh, 15 20 miles apart this doesn't look a, a huge uh, variation here but but it's 15 percent variation in survival and and we can um have some fairly good ideas about what, 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 what the causes of that are. The next slide. So this is the National Sophica Gastric Report. Next slide. Um, that we participate in this and we have done for about the last seven years. And, and this will be data based on uh, the last three years of data. So this is looking at the routes to the diagnosis. People can look back at these slides and the actual sort of data. But these are regions in England on the left side of the graph and then in, uh, highlighted in, in, in yellow um, regions in Wales, um, whereby we're seeing uh, much higher uh, rates of emergency presentation as the route to diagnosis of cancer. Um, I did question whether you know, this data was right. I've only looked at about 100 case records from an Iron Bevan and it did seem to be accurate. What we mean by emergency presentation, they're ultimately coded as an emergency uh, diagnosed cancer, whether these were waiting for diagnostics referred through from primary care into A&E or into hospital or direct attendances in A&E. Obviously, you need to break down the, the, the data. Uh, but, but I think this is there is something real um, happening here, which, which, is a, which is a worry. Next slide. We are going to point out the things that we're not doing so well, just because they may be the causes of, uh, of things that we may focus uh, to look at it and improving things. Um, there hasn't been an awful lot of change in terms of the stage of diagnosis. Um, so really, we, we want to be diagnosing stages in one, two, three, um, and ideally not at three and four. And there hasn't been an awful lot of change in that um, uh, uh, over time. Next slide. Um, and uh, this is looking at esophagogastric can cancer compared to other cancers. And you could probably, you know, uh, guess yourselves, you know, which of those cancers that tend to present with more advanced disease, uh, you know, pancreatic cancer, lung cancer, etc., um, as opposed to uh, skin, breast, uh, uh, prostate, etc. Um, so this is the distribution. We know that we need to be diagnosing patients with, a, uh, with OG cancer. And we'll talk about some of the, um, uh, uh, the early diagnosis diagnostic systems we have uh, later in the talk. Next slide, not sure I've got many left. Um, so this is the time from referral uh, to the start of curative treatment. Um, so this is effectively what we do as a point of suspicion um, in that we have a single cancer pathway in Wales for all referrals into the system, whereas we compare ourselves with England where they have the two week wait, which is very similar to our old USC pathway. So primary care referrals into the system. And these are the days we know the target is to start first definitive therapy within 62 days. That itself is two full months for about four, four or five tests and, and discussions with a specialist team. The, the median uh, waiting time um, in all of our um, organizations is longer than that. So, you know, 50% of patients are waiting longer than these timelines from when we think, and we're pretty sure they've got cancer, usually at the time of endoscopy, to the time they start treatment. So a lot of room for improvement there. Next slide. And I think that's it for me. As I say, really happy to take questions at the end um, and come back and talk about wider context of, uh, of, of cancer uh, uh, outcomes and services in Wales uh, at another time. But I'll hand over to you, Jeff. Great. That's great. Thanks, Tom. Um, so I'm Jeff Turner. I'm a, a gastroenterologist based in Cardiff and Vale. 
um, but also work with Tom and the, the single cancer pathway team as one of the, the co-clinical leads. Um, next slide, please. Um, so as Tom alluded to earlier, you know, there are pressures um, in diagnostics um, that may be contributing towards some of the challenges that we're seeing um, in the diagnosis of, of upper GI cancer. Um, one of my colleagues introduced me to Twitter not too long ago, and it's a great educational tool and keeping up to date. So I got this slide actually from Twitter, just showing the constraints. This is actually based upon English data, um, but particularly with um, endoscopy um, in terms of elective activity. Next slide, please. Um, so as Tom mentioned, in the single cancer pathway, we've got a series of national optimal pathways, and we've got several for, for upper GI cancer. Um, and this slide just highlights some of the, the key compon components. And I think it's worth just looking at the, the front end of the pathway um, as the referrals come in, you know, from yourselves in, in primary care, um, which are now largely received electronically, I know in Cardiff and Vale, and, and across lots of the health boards in, in South Wales. Um, it goes through a process and usually in the UHB referral centre um, and then the electronic referrals pushed on either to gastroenterology or to upper GI surgical um, colleagues for triage. And I think there probably is opportunity there looking at pathways about how we improve the timeliness in that part of the pathway, particularly around our triage in secondary care. So thinking about upper GI cancers, um, you have to be relatively unfit um, or, or not willing to, to undergo an OGD as, as probably our gold standard diagnostic test really for, for diagnosing upper GI cancers. But where patients don't want to, to consider that as a, a potential route of investigation or if their fitness um, is probably not optimal for an OGD, um, then a minority of patients come for outpatient assessment initially. Um, once we've done our OGD, then that generally leads to a cascade of next steps. Um, and some of the health boards uh, are performing accelerated CT staging, which I think has been a fantastic step forward. And we're working with health boards as, as part of the single cancer pathway work um, to try and roll this out um, across all health boards um, throughout Wales. Um, but in essence, when patient attends for their OGD and we suspect they've got cancer, um, it's our best practice. And as part of JAG, um, we advise the patients and, and relatives um, supporting them as well about our suspicions of cancer before they leave the endoscopy unit um, and after their sedation's worn off, um, if that's applicable. Um, we also involve the key worker at this stage as well. So sometimes that's done electronically or where possible and key workers are on site such as UHW. They often come down to the department um, by way of introduction and, and have that initial conversation um, with the patient about next steps. I mentioned about accelerated staging. So, you know, any patient really attending for endoscopy where we, we suspect cancer, the next question is well, what's going to happen next so um, this has been a great step forward and means that we can often complete CT staging either that afternoon that day or potentially within the next 24 hours and the aim is again to move that patient through the pathway um, to give them as much information as possible um, and get them onto appropriate treatment and next steps so beyond this um, patients usually go through to the MDT and potentially a host of other diagnostic tests um, prior to reviewing clinic um, and then discussion about appropriate treatments. So next slide, please. So our referrals are currently still based upon mice NG12. Um, and when we suspect cancer, um, the main criteria that we use are, are dysphagia and that applies to people of any age and any length of dysphagia. Um, in, in terms of history, um, but also people are, are greater than 55 years old or 55 and above with weight loss and symptoms of abdominal pain, reflux, um, or dyspepsia. Um, we've also got the non-urgent group, which includes hematemesis, um, and, and has listed people over the age of 55 years old or of the age of 55 
and the variety of different symptoms, which hand on high can never remember. So I've got it up on my wall um, by my computer for, for clinics and for vetting. I think it is quite important to try and get things right at the triage stage because COVID has hit diagnostic services quite significantly, as we know, um, and suspected cancer waiting times for diagnostics are roughly maintained within two to three weeks, whereas there's been a big hit, particularly with patients of the urgent and routine category, where they might wait potentially up to 11 to 16 weeks. And again, that does vary between different health boards. So I think it's important, you know, we get as much information um, about symptoms um, at the point of referral. Next slide, please. So diagnostic. So the, the principal diagnostic tests that we've got, our gold standard, as I said, is upper GI endoscopy. Um, and as we discuss, we tend to use that for the majority of our patients. Um, the benefits are that it allows mucosal assessment and biopsies. So for instance, if we, we find evidence of Barrett's esophagus, it allows assessment of the mucosa and gives a lot more detailed information about the, the upper GI tract. I think we have to accept though, it's, it's, it's not a very nice test. Um, it's quite a short test, usually lasts about, about eight or so minutes. And there are different ways that we can undertake it depending upon the patient's comorbidity. Um, and currently we use throat spray um, and there is the option of using that in combination with sedation if, if the patient's fit enough. Um, Hassan will talk a bit later, but there are other sorts of ways to undertake up a GI endoscopy, um, such as transnasal endoscopy that's, that's been evaluated in several centres in Wales. I've also mentioned about barium swallow and meals because that can sometimes come up during referrals. Um, but I know at least locally in Cardiff and Vale, um, we strongly advocate avoiding this as a diagnostic test for people with suspected cancer symptoms. Um, and that's based really upon audit data and, and local data that we've gathered um, that showed 7.5% of patients diagnosed with cancer at an endoscopy had had a preceding normal barium swallow. So it's not really a very good test um, apart from looking for significant structural change. Um, However, we do use it to assess for benign diseases, so things like pharyngeal pouches in patients with high dysphagia or potentially dysmotility. Um, so I would strongly discourage um, referrals for barium swallow or meal if we suspect patients have cancer. So new, next slide, please. Um, we've also got some other, I suppose, vaguer symptoms that patients might present with. So they, they may present with early satiety um, which isn't covered as a symptom in the NICE guideline, um, but potential causes can be benign, such as functional dyspepsia, but equally due to malignant processes like lionitis plastica. Um, so my, my suggestion would be is, you know, to refer those as suspected cancer priority, and then we can sort of assess based upon the information given um, and, and prioritise then in, in secondary care. We also get quite a few patients referred generally with weight loss. And I must admit, I don't automatically go straight for upper GI endoscopy um, unless they've got symptoms. And as an initial first step, generally arrange for, for CT tap, um, which could sometimes be sort of supported through the RDC process, um, depending upon um, which health board you're referring within. Um, would also advocate FBC, ferritin, TFTs and, and celiac serology as part of your sort of metabolic screen. And again, just looking for um, any clues um, such as iron deficiency anemia that might require broader GI investigation. Um, and I think FIT has again exploded throughout COVID and is a, is a great way forward. But again, you know, allows assessment of patients with, with weight loss as well. Um, people may also present with odynophagia. It's not a common symptom. Um, but if people do get pain on swallowing, um, refer, um, and we largely base the priority depending upon their, their other broader symptoms, such as weight loss, because again, the, the potential causes can be bright, quite broad from esophagitis, again, due to malignancy in, in a smaller number of cases. So next slide, please. 
Um, in terms of other information that's really valuable when patients are referred is actually the level of dysphagia. It can be quite hard, as we know, to pinpoint down for patients. And again, it's not very accurate. Um, but if we do get a sense that people have oropharyngeal dysphagia versus esophageal, um, it's really valuable to have that information in the referral um, to try and distinguish really whether people might go more down an ENT investigation route or, or more of a upper GI endoscopy um, and gastroenterology and upper GI surgical investigation route. And again, I would just probe the patient a bit more about other potentially ENT symptoms if they've got higher up dysphagia, so hoarse voice um, and, and symptoms such as that. And that's largely because of the slightly different tests that we perform and we don't get the best of views um, when we do an upper GI endoscopy um, looking at the pharynx. Um, the other thing just to signpost you to is the Edinburgh dysphagia score as well. Um, so that is um, a score that's been looked at uh, as well as another score um, called the cancer dysphagia score, which is very similar, but includes components such as age and again, the level of dysphagia as well the duration of symptoms, gender, whether the patient's got coexisting reflux symptoms, and also whether they've had any weight loss um, in the previous three months. And that can give a high risk score or a low risk score. So using the score, if patients fall into the high risk category, the sensitivity for, for upper GI cancer detection is around 96.7%. The negative predictive value is about 99.3%. So again, if there's opportunity to include this in referrals, it does give us a little bit more information um, and helps us with the triage process. So next slide. So I'm going to hand over to my colleague now, Hassan Habibi. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so uh, my name is Hassan Habibi. I'm a gastroenterologist here in Cardiff and Vale. And um, Jeff has really set the scene, I think, for um, what um, we are trying to do for some of these patients. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and ultimately, I guess what we're talking about for the investigation of these patients is uh, performing endoscopy. So um, hopefully most of the patients referred on will have a normal endoscopy. There's a picture of a normal esophagus at the top of the screen and a normal gastric antrum at the bottom of the screen. And, next, and then... Um, Clearly what we want to detect if we can, um, and we hope we, our patients don't have it, but if we can at an early stage are things like cancers. Uh, so an esophageal cancer there at the top of the screen and a, a nasty ulcerated gastric malignancy at the bottom. Next, please. Um, and I guess um, there is a huge role for endoscopy as well in the detection of pre-malignant conditions, uh, such as Barrett's esophagus there at the top of the screen and, and gastric polyps, all of which can be treated uh, at an early stage to prevent hopefully to prevent cancer from, from uh, progressing. Next, please. Um, there's some a slide, which is an old slide, actually, pre-COVID um, from Cancer Research UK. And I think this was pretty much where we were all um, looking and heading our, our, our kind of our general direction in terms of allocation of services and, uh, and capacity uh, and the need for increased endoscopy to capture some of these patients uh, at an early stage. Next slide, please. Um, and then COVID hit. Uh, and uh, this is data from um, all four nations showing the complete obliteration of endoscopy services um, during the COVID pandemic um, with various bits of guidelines, um, guidelines both from the British Society of Gastroenterology and also other kind of um, uh, other parties really uh, suggesting the need to, uh, to focus on, on other areas really as, as part of COVID uh, general management. Next slide, please. Um, and so this is what happened in real terms, in terms of endoscopy. Um, what, what I'll try and draw your eyes to are um, the, the fact that we tried to maintain, sorry, um, some emergency work. And so the emergency work as a percentage increased. Um, but what really took a hit was a lot of our routine work dropping from about 50% to 20%. And our surveillance of these pre-malignant conditions from, from 3 to 1%. Next slide, please. Um, and uh, and next, uh, please. Uh, and, and I guess uh, the key thing as a result of this um, is that this has been modeled to show that uh, during that period of COVID and um, 
uh, I, I guess those those initial lockdowns, um, we probably ended up missing a number of cancers. And so there's esophageal cancers at the top of the screen and uh, gastric cancers uh, at, at the bottom, up to 50 percent or so. Next slide, please. Um, Jeff alluded to some of this data earlier. Uh, so uh, English data that was published, I think, earlier this week from the Royal College of Surgeons in collaboration with University of Birmingham. Next, please. Um, and um, this was some modeling data looking at the impact of those patients that we didn't um, perform endoscopy on during COVID times, um, as well as new referrals that are coming through that I guess are, are part of a backlog. Next, please. Um, and uh, showing that um, endoscopy, uh, both lower GI and, and also upper GI endoscopy, make up about 1.2 million procedures that are needing to be done at some point um, over the next few years. So a huge burden on endoscopy. Next, please. Um, and so um, Professor Crosby earlier gave some, some quite um, depressing statistics about Wales as well. And what I'd like to do is maybe um, offer a glimmer of hope over the, over the next few slides um, and talk about two ways in which we're trying to tackle these challenges um, in Wales a, a, little, a little bit more head on and with a bit of innovation uh, and, and some blue sky thinking. Um, so I'm going to talk about transnasal endoscopy, which um, is a pilot we ran here in Cardiff and Vale. Um, funded by the Moon Dance Cancer Initiative. Um, next slide, please. So transnasal endoscopy is a, an ultra thin camera that passes through the nose. It doesn't require any sedation. And um, we found that you could uh, you could perform this in, uh, in pretty much anywhere that, that you've got access to um, a bed, um, some electricity and some portable suction. Um, and so we reused <clears throat> one of our rooms that we were performing either clinic consultations or capsule endoscopies in. Um, and um, I've highlighted um, a figure there in, in red uh, from a paper that we recently wrote. Uh, some of the key benefits of transnasal endoscopy, both within um, kind of the endoscopy footprint, but actually this can be taken out into portable um, uh, vans or buses into community hospitals, potentially even GP practices. So utilizing space, uh, space more effectively um, you, you don't need uh, multiple nurses. You can only um, you can get away with having a single nurse. The patients are unsedated. Uh, they tolerate the procedure well and can usually be discharged immediately after their procedure. Um, next slide, please. Um, and so the data from our Cardiff and Vale collaboration uh, with Moon Dance and Comtaf Health Board um, over three months here, and, and the, the the pilot is just completing in Comtaf now. Um, we offered transnasal to 120 patients. We got through just over 100 patients. Uh, all of these patients were unsedated and we typically had about six or so patients on a list. Uh, and that was just uh, a, a, an endoscopist and a, and a nurse supporting. We managed to train up a number of, of, of other practitioners during the pilot. Uh, and we tried to bring through some of these long waiting patients uh, that had been affected during COVID. Next slide, please. Um, and um, overall, um, uh, we had a, a number of successes. We managed to, to achieve a good diagnosis and a reassuring diagnosis in the majority of patients, but we did pick up a gastric cancer in a patient with high-grade dysplastic Barrett's. In patients that have, had already been waiting over two years because of COVID and potentially could have been waiting longer. Uh, and there were some other small successes in terms of patients that previously hadn't tolerated endoscopy in the past and would have been waiting for a general anesthetic procedure. 90% of those we managed to get through a transnasal procedure. And in all those patients that had previously had an endoscopy, when asked if they would prefer to have a transnasal in future or a gastroscopy, a, a typical conventional oral endoscopy, 94% would prefer to have a transnasal. So very well tolerated. Next slide, please. Um, and then I'm just gonna maybe end in a minute or so on cytosponge. Uh, next, please. Um, and um, I think cytosponge, was something that very much was research-based, but now there's really good research, so real-world evidence from across the UK. Uh, next, please. And um, through Moondance again and their wonderful work uh, in North Wales, a pilot is, is just running on patients with Barrett's esophagus. Uh, next, please. Um, so Cytosponge is, um, uh, as it says, really, it's a, it's a sponge on a bit of string. So a, a capsule is swallowed. Uh, the key thing is to hold to the piece of string on the, on the other side. Um, you wait a few minutes and then that capsule dissolves and um, this sponge uh, expands in, in the stomach. Um, and then um, a slow pull of the string allows the sponge to obtain cells across the upper stomach, the whole of the esophagus and the oropharynx. Um, and then you, you cut that bit of string and that sponge into a pot and, and send it off uh, to Cambridge for analysis. Uh, next, please. 
Um, and um, it, it's really been used as uh, part of a research tool initially, but um, uh, now, um, I guess, as part of COVID recovery by, by a number of colleagues across the UK, um, both in the detection of Barrett's esophagus and also in vague symptoms in, 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 um, in some patients or, or just the evaluation of reflux disease. Um, this is from the BEST-3 study where they randomized patients to either cytosponge um, or conventional um, endoscopy. Next, please. Um, and um, they found that cytosponge um, had a, a tenfold increase in the detection of, of Barrett's esophagus. Um, and I think within the... Um, 13,000 or so patients, 6,500 in each arm in that cytosponge Barrett's positive arm. Um, they detected, I think, nine cases of dysplasia or, or early cancer, and no, uh, no dysplasia or early cancers were detected in the usual arm. Um, next slip, please. Um, and so uh, I guess um, where cytosponge may move um, is, uh, so that was, I guess, a, a primary care type study. Um, uh, but but it, it is uh, something that could be used potentially in primary care. Um, it could be used for very symptomatic patients referred to secondary care. And as part of those best studies, I think it, it may have a role in Barrett surveillance. Uh, this is some of the inclusion and exclusion criteria from uh, CITED that runs the analysis. Next, please. And this is my final slide. Um, the, I guess this is um, where I'm going with this and this kind of blue sky thinking. Uh, and I'll focus your, your, your attention really to the um, schematic on the left hand side. Right now, we do a lot of endoscopy and probably a lot of normal endoscopy, um, and it may not be very efficient for your patients um, or, or, or for us in secondary care. Uh, and so that the bottom figure suggests maybe by doing cytosponge, we can identify those patients most at risk. Um, and then when we do perform endoscopies, perform, um, I guess, more clinically significant scopes to detect those patients most at risk and then identify cancers at an early stage. So I'll stop there um, with the next slide, I think, which will hand over to, to the next speaker. Thanks, Hassan. That was great. Um, so my name's Dr. Baxan Thomas. I'm a consultant clinical oncologist in Belindra Cancer Centre. And over the sort of uh, next seven minutes or so, I'm going to talk to you about the management of uh, esophageal gastric cancer in adults. There is a lot to, to cover, so it's a little bit of a whistle-stop tour, really. Um, so discuss management options in both early and late stage esophageal gastric cancer discuss challenging um, challenges, sorry, when we're managing this largely elderly and or frail comorbid patient group. Um, and also talk a little bit about new treatment options that are becoming available to us um, because we're always trying to um, personalize treatment as much as possible uh, for the patient in front of us. So we take into account uh, lots of different factors when we're selecting primary therapy um, for patients. As you can imagine, we need to know about the tumour stage and location, as well as type, nutritional status, um, but the most important thing is also patient preference, as well as their performance status and comorbidities. Um, Professor Crosby talked to us a little bit about the data that we have from the National Esophageal Gastric Cancer Audit. Um, so bullet points on the slide here, but the median age, 72 years, the majority are male, Unfortunately, UK-wide, 42% are diagnosed at stage four, um, and only 40% of patients have a plan for treatment with curative intent. So, I mean, the strap line here really is that the majority of patients diagnosed with OG cancer have advanced disease um, or are too frail for curative treatment and are therefore managed with non-curative treatment intent. So stage one to three esophageal cancer is usually treated with resection, um, either endoscopic if it's very early or surgical resection if it's more advanced, if fitness allows. But the majority of patients will relapse following surgery alone. And the two graphs here with the esophageal adenocarcinoma on the left and gastric adenocarcinoma on the right really just highlight the high um, risk of recurrence and therefore um, poor overall survival, um, which is also dependent on the stage at presentation. So these are ESMO guidelines, so the European Society of Medical Oncology guidelines. Um, these were released in 2016, and they're actually due for an update soon. But really, over the last 10 years or so, um, there's been a lot of emphasis on multimodal treatment for OG cancer. 
with the aim of improving outcomes. There's a lot of information on this slide, but I'll just go through it step by step. So if it's limited disease, so it's very early disease, and by that we sort of mean T1A, if you remember your T&M staging from medical school. Um, if it's just the inner lining of the mucosa effective, affected, it may be amenable to EMR, um, and we often refer patients to uh, Dr. Hassan Habubi for this. But unfortunately, it's the minority of patients that present with um, this sort of very early stage of disease. Um, if it's T2, they may be able to go straight to surgery if um, fitness allows. Actually, the bulk of people that we discuss in the MDT um, are here um, or more advanced. So locally advanced uh, in this category sort of includes T3 or T4 disease uh, or node positive disease. And we do split them into histology. So squamous cell or adenocarcinoma because they are very different disease entities. Squim cell cancers tend to be more radiosensitive. Um, so treatment paradigms, and this is the gold standard treatment pathway, but this is obviously only if fitness allows really. But um, if you've got a fit patient, you may be able to offer them neoadjuvant. So what I mean by that is treatment that becomes um, before the definitive treatment. Um, so upfront chemo radiotherapy followed by restaging and resection uh, if it remains operable. Or well, there is some evidence to show that definitive chemo radiotherapy um, has similar outcomes. Um, so no surgery, but the mainstay of treatment is chemo radiotherapy, um, followed by the option of salvage resection um, if the recurrence is detected and if fitness allows. And for adenocarcinoma, um, surgery is the mainstay of treatment. We do try and offer um, some sort of oncological therapy in combination with surgery, uh, either perioperative chemotherapy followed by a resection. By perioperative, we just mean chemo before and after surgery, uh, or neoadjuvant chemo radiotherapy prior to surgery. Um, we do have to remember that the, in adenocarcinoma, some um, a proportion of patients will either be unfit for surgery or will have inoperable disease um, and therefore definitive chemo radiotherapy can possibly be an option for these patients um, although there is some evidence to say that uh, surgery remains the gold standard if fit in adenocarcinoma and then moving on to the sort of treatment options for operable gastric cancer. So surgery is the only curative treatment for um, gastric cancer. Um, if it's very early stage, there may be consideration of endoscopic or limited resection, but the vast majority present with more advanced disease. So the preferred pathway um, here would be preoperative chemotherapy. So chemotherapy upfront, um, followed by surgery, followed by a course of post-operative chemotherapy if they have recovered sufficiently after surgery. Um, although in other parts of the country, some, uh, sorry, other parts of the world, some go straight to surgery and then have post-op, so adjuvant, either chemotherapy or chemotherapy. Important aspects of care, obviously the MDT planning is mandatory. It's really important to have um, a wide panel of experts when we're coming to treatment options, uh, decision making for these patients. Um, and just to touch upon centralization of surgical care as well. So um, for patients with OG cancer, um, centralization of surgery has improved surgical standards and survival for patients undergoing surgery for this disease. And as you may know, um, Cardiff is um, the center where they perform surgery for OG cancer in South Wales. Uh, and you may have some awareness of sort of enhanced recovery programs as well as prehabilitation and rehabilitation, all with the um, aims of improving outcomes and reducing length of stay. So I'm not a surgeon, um, and I forgive me for the sort of simplicity of these slides, but I just thought I'd talk to you a little bit about suffragectomy. So the vast majority of procedures in the UK is an Ivor Lewis procedure. This is two phase um, where the patient has a midline laparotomy initially, mobilization of the stomach, a fusion jejunostomy is normally inserted, and then the patient has an abdominal lymph node dissection. And the patient is then turned over and has a posterior lateral thoracotomy where the esophagectomy is performed with an on block lymphadenectomy, 
and then there's a gastric pull up so where the um, gas the stomach is then pulled in up into the thorax and anastomosed. It is a major operation it's associated with significant morbidity and mortality and recovery of quality of life can take a number of years postoperatively. Gastrectomy then um, depends a little bit on where the disease is, it could either be a partial gastrectomy or a distal gastrectomy if there's distal disease, uh, or a total gastrectomy if uh, a more significant proportion of the stomach has been affected. And if fitness allows, the gold standard is to um, carry this out with an extended lymphadenectomy. However, unfortunately, poor overall survival compared to other tumor types, despite advances in potentially curative multimodal therapy. And so it is important that when we follow up these patients that we provide information about the symptoms of recurrent disease and that they know who to turn to um, when they do have any symptoms of concern, offer rapid access back into the OGMDT um, and we concentrate on symptoms as well as nutrition and psychosocial support as well. So the last few slides then are just touching about touching on treatment options for advanced or metastatic OG disease. Um, as you probably know, stage four cancer is usually incurable. incurable. We could offer, uh, as oncologists, systemic anti-cancer anti treatments, so that involves either chemotherapy, immunotherapy, or targeted agents. Um, and in a select group of patients, these can improve survival compared to best supportive care alone. So we normally say with best supportive care alone, uh, overall survival is between three and six months, and this be, can be extended by an additional three to six months um, with treatment. We strongly um, encourage participation in clinical trials. Um, but it's just to highlight that actually, um, if the patient is of 80 plus, active treatment plans are less common nationwide. Um, and these type of patients, mainly you know, elderly and or frail, tend um, sometimes to opt for supportive care alone. Um, and that is sometimes um, because of patient choice, but sometimes due to frailty. So early referral to the community palliative care team is essential. Um, here are the ESMO guidelines for metastatic disease, but the most important thing here is, unfortunately, standard first-line chemotherapies for advanced to metastatic, metastatic OG cancer results in poor overall survival. So median survival for these patients is less than one year. And many patients with metastatic disease, they only receive one line of treatment. They're normally only fit enough for one line of treatment. So they don't really have an opportunity to benefit from other lines of treatment. So important that we get our treatment decisions correct up front. And there's been a lot of emphasis recently on personalised medicine. So finding biomarkers that can improve the efficacy of treatment depending on the patient's tumour. So... Um, 2010, this was a TOGA trial looking at the role of HER2 testing uh, with the addition of Herceptin for those with HER2 positive um, disease. Um, and this, for the first time, um, proved um, extended overall survival for just over one year for these patients. Um, and then just to talk to you a little bit about the GO2 trial, looked at low-dose chemotherapy um, for patients with frail and elderly population, and this provided a better patient experience and gave us the um, gave us the confidence to be able to prescribe chemotherapy for the elderly and frail group at lower dose. And it has been shown to be as effective as effective with a, base, a better patient experience as well. And then immunotherapy. Literally over the last year, um, we're now allowed to prescribe immunotherapy for patients with OG cancer for, for a very select patient group. So first line um, combined with chemotherapy, um, patients with a CPS greater of 10, uh, this has improved survival to over one year for the first time in this patient group. Um, and also in the adjuvant setting for patients who have um, upfront chemo radiotherapy followed by surgery, there's residual disease found at the time of surgery. Um, adjuvant nivolumab has shown to double the median disease-free survival. Symptom control is so, so important. Um, patients often get dysphagia, bleeding and pain. There has been a role for self-expanding metal stents um, or palliative radiotherapy for dysphagia. Stents can pro provide immediate relief um, for swelling difficulties. Um, radiotherapy also may have a role to play, but can take slower, um, longer time to take effect. 
uh, and dysphagia deterioration and reintervention is common. And then there was this wonderful trial by Professor Anthony, Bur uh, Professor Anthony Byrne and his team. Um, this was called the ROX trial, and it looked at, at the role of radiotherapy after stenting for a patient with advances of the gastric cancer. And it showed that there's actually no additional benefit from palliative radiotherapy following stent insertion. But for a minority of patients clinically at high risk of tumor bleeding, palliative radiotherapy may reduce the risk. And that's me done. We are my turn now. Um, so I'm Hannah uh, Johnston, a uh, dietitian here at Blindre. So again, probably like the other presentations, a bit of a whistle stop tour of um, nutrition, nutritional management for the esophageal gastric patients as well. Uh, next slide, slide please. Thank you. So just a little bit of background around sort of the high risk of malnutrition in these patients. Um, so in, in particularly our sort of um, nutrition guidelines, um, so we know the negative impact of malnutrition and quality of life and treatment toxicities. And it's been estimated that 10 to 20% of cancer patients die due to their consequences of malnutrition rather than tumour itself. And in particular, NICE has recognised the importance of dietetic and specialist dietetic um, support um, and how Nutrition plays an important role in the management of these esophageal gastric patients, particularly highlighting the physical changes. So as has been touched on in previous presentations, um, so with this type of cancer, we get the swallowing difficulty, that dysphagia, and the loss of weight, and the early satiety, and the malnutrition. Thank you. Slide, thank you. Um, so I'm just going to touch a little bit more um, around sort of nutrition support. So really what you could do, you know, sort of even early diagnosis, you see a patient um, as sort of talk through a few steps with nutrition support. So in particular, we want to look at a high energy, high protein diet. These patients, they can't eat large, eat large volumes, um, trying to go little and often. So looking at those energy dense foods, in particular, protein is also important because with weight loss, we have also have muscle mass loss as well. Then we can look at food fortification. So how are we gonna add extra energy without increasing the quantity? So adding full fat products, cream, cheese, butter to the current sort of intake. Um, then we can also look at oral nutritional supplements. Um, so we do find a lot of patients need these um, straight away. So we have to consider the volume consistency. Uh, patients can't manage the larger 200 volumes. Is there the compact versions we can go for? Consider preferences. I know in the community um, there is um, sort of first line powder supplements, but also we have the milk base, the juice base, patients' preferences, um, sweet or savory. There's actually a um, new savory powdered soups out there. So is that another alternative we can use for the patients that don't want the sweet options as well? then important little and often so this applied to those with poor appetite large meals can be off-putting but also as we've mentioned around surgical patients when do we change the anatomy so for example like a total um, partial gastrectomy um, patients can't actually have the volumes that they used to as well thank you next slide thank you um, and a little bit more around texture modification, because I think this is something we can actually get and give advice quite early on, especially when patients are presenting with dysphagia. Um, as mentioned earlier on, uh, we need to consider the grade of dysphagia and then the type of dysphagia. Um, so in particular, you know, it's more of an esophageal, lower obstruction, rather than some of your potentially where speech and language get involved with high um, you know, muscle changes or um, high aspiration risk as well. So it's identifying the type of dysphagia and looking at the kind of symptoms of dysphagia that patients are presenting with. So particularly looking at a little bit more detail. Um, what we can find is patients describe they're being sick, but actually it's regurgitation. Um, certain um, foods and textures can't go past that tumour, so that actually physically will regurgitate these foods. So how often is that happening? Um, can they get down softer foods? Um, so it's exploring that little bit more depth, which is what I do a lot in my current role as well. So we can I give advice around adapting textures. Can we go softer foods, foods that can be easily more 
mashed up easily. Actually talking about avoiding foods that stick or causing problems, making foods um, more moist by adding gravies, sauces. There's a lot that patients can do to adapt and um, help get actually the nutrition down, stopping them from regurging the food as well. And actually some patients even have, need a puree or liquid diet, some can't tolerate the lumps. Um, so it's trying to tailor um, that advice to them and particularly maybe relying more on supplement high energy drinks there as well. And obviously this level of dysphagia, and it again depends on their, their radical palliative intent or treatment pathway as where we would go and how we would action on this dysphagia as well. Um, so I'll go to the next slide, thank you. So in particularly um, those palliative patients, as um, Betsa mentioned, um, we go down the route of a palliative um, stent for them as well. So it's just a little bit around um, a stent here and then sort of from what I've observed and, you know, what advice we would give at this stage. So we know once that stent is inserted and actually take up to two weeks to expand and settle, so patients can still present with that pain and discomfort and actually can still struggle at first to come build up their textures. Um, what we got patients to do is take time to eat, chew well, um, wash foods down with fluids. Um, and as it does improve their quality of eating, and um, there's still some restrictions and still some foods that could block them. So they've just got to be cautious, particularly with bread, which becomes quite doughy, and like a forms of a ball, and toast can be a particular pastries, and um, tough or grossly meats, anything crispy, fried eggs, Go get crispy so you scrambled, soft is much easier. Uh, fish with bones, uh, fibrous meat and vegetables, so um, fruit and vegetables there. So just being patients be aware of that. And if a patient presents with a block stent, you know, there's a few things. Um, stop eating, stand up. A fizzy drink can actually, so something like Coca-Cola can actually try and break down what is in the um, stent as well, walking around. And if it's not clear, and obviously have to use that camera to have a little bit further of whether it's a food bolus or potentially sometimes can get overgrowth, overgrowth of the stents, they might need another stent as well. Um, so yeah, that's uh, my last slide. So um, I know we were, thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you ever so much to all the speakers. Um, really fascinating talk. I'm, I can think of lots of sort of questions that it's provoked and sort of thoughts in me um, from just hearing the different topics. And, you know, we've gone from one end of the spectrum to the other with um, Professor Cosby's, you know, talk about um, late stage diagnosis and, and, you know, where Wales sits in comparison to other um, developed nations um, to sort of really practical advice that you can use in primary care as well. We're really grateful for that. I don't know that we've got any specific questions that have come in, just sort of compliments to the speakers. To is tight. I don't know if any of the speakers have any closing comments that they would like to, to make. Other than that, I think we'll um, round off and say thank you to the um, to the panelists and um, and move on. Anything anyone wants to come in on? Well. Thank you, Charlotte, for um, organising the event. Um, there's a feedback slide, Bets, and I know you've closed it down, you probably can't really share it, but um, we can always email it out to you. It's got the link to complete the survey if you've attended today, and then Charlotte can get you a certificate to send out to um, for your appraisal folders and whatever. So please do feel free to fill that in, and it also helps us just guide and, and lead the next session according to what your needs are. So thanks again to everyone that's um, spoken today. We've had some really fascinating speakers and, and obviously hugely knowledgeable and very grateful for the in, in, um, attendance and the fact that it was really targeted to primary care. So it's really helpful. So thank you to Professor Crosby and Dr. Thomas at Belindra, as well as Hannah, um, the uh, dietitian who's just really given an, an informative chat there. And then the two gastroenterologists from um, Cardiff and Vale, who are Dr. Turner and Dr. Habubi. So thank you. And the slide did pop up briefly, didn't it? But it's gone down, but thank you. Take care. <laughs> Sorry, Elise, thank you very much for. No worries. And hopefully, um, people found it useful. Thank you. Bye bye.